Um, yeah, welcome, you guys. It's good to see you and talk to you again. And uh, Shaq Sunny Keek and I are excited to teach you together today. And uh, we wanted to open up by seeing if you guys have any questions or comments for both of us. I just wanted to say I missed Tuesday because we were over at my Uncle Paul's house. Um, he's also Queen Gant. Um, but yeah, I made him a Valentine box like super late because they wouldn't take me to my uncle's house. So I just delivered that the other day on Tuesday. So, so I no missed problem. It was like enough time, but like my grandpa got to talking with my uncle Paul and they were talking for like an hour more. <laughs> yeah, nice. It's valuable time. Mm -hmm. Any more questions or comments to start us off? But I had all your questions answered on Tuesday. The introduction. Yeah, I shared with Shaksani Keek, Keek some of the questions that you all asked me. A few of them, you guys had a lot of good questions on Tuesday about the self introduction. I challenged you with the opportunity to practice reciting your self introduction and we all practice it using the notes. One of our goals is to help you get there without using your notes. Um, and then also you guys had good questions about asking where, how to say I, where I was born, where I grew up. And uh, I went over those today in our planning period with Shaksani Keek. So if you have any more questions, it's a great time to ask her or both of us. I have, I have a question. I yeah. I haven't been able to make it. I'm, I'm sorry for the last few classes, but I, I tried to watch some of the video of the classes and especially the one on the introduction. And I remember someone did ask um, in the context of introducing yourself when to acknowledge the opposite clan. So if I'm in more of a formal public non clinket perhaps, or non-clinket dominant event. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do a self-introduction in, in, you know, clinket style and clinket cultural thing. Where would the acknowledgement of the opposite clan come in during that introduction? Would I introduce myself first and then make acknowledgement of the opposite clan, as opposed to the last time we were talking we thought that we would acknowledge the opposite clan first before the self-introduction. Oh. Any thoughts there, Shirley? Yeah, uh, the, the uh, important part of your introduction is uh, to introduce yourself and your mother. Yeah. Mother's clan. Okay. Then go to the opposite clan or okay. opposite side. Uh, your your father's people. Yes. Thank now, that, you. That comes okay. after uh, because of where matrilineal uh, your mother and your clan comes first. Yes, that's that's what I thought. Thank you for that. I, that is one thing that has been drilled into me since I was a kid is we're matrilineal, we're matrilineal. Know your you know, you're of your mother's people, et cetera. So yes, drilled into me that one. <laughs> yeah, Thank but, you. Uh, you. You really uh, can give honor to your father's side by yes. okay. telling them. And, and it's actually just kind of mentioning my father. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for asking that question. Cause on Tuesday I was <clears throat> I was telling you guys, um, I'm not sure, but I think you could do your father's people first. But when Chakasani Kik and I talked about it today, um, 
she mentioned that to me. I'm glad that you asked so that everyone could hear that you you acknowledge who you are on your mother's side and then mention your father's people. And, uh, Can I do that still if my mother's side is the non Klingit side? Still. Still, that's a, an important part of your introduction. You want to include that, yeah. Good questions. It's of interest to whoever you're talking to. And I was wondering too, so if your mother is non clinket technically she would have been adopted by the opposite clan anyway, correct? Yeah, if she is, yeah. 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 Uh, I've talked to people where, uh, and I think it's the fault of the father if they don't take the, the new uh, spouse to be introduced to, to the people so that they can decide uh, about and to come much later and say i need to have my wife uh, adopted and then it, people look at each other uh who's going to do it you know yeah so it's uh, I, a lot of times uh, in my case when my my husband uh, landed in huna and we were, we were getting married He's so charming, and he just charmed a whole bunch of people, and they wanted to adopt him right away. So that's what happened. So, yeah, got to take advantage of that. Just <laughs> charming enough to to get to the right people. That's right. You don't have to ask, but what you can can do is, uh, I'm getting married, and uh, he or she is not. Uh, native, so uh, mm -hmm. what is your advice? Can you help me mm -hmm. what, uh, uh, to uh, do an adoption? Mm -hmm. And uh, the adoption of the spouse is not uh, a big public event. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, between a few people talk about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Christies don't have to worry about it. and that ha happens with your kids like you uh it didn't get your spouse adopted but now you have children and uh, it makes it harder to have the children uh because you first you have to go through the process of adopting the spouse and then the children so yeah. Uh, Shirley, thank you. Super helpful. Yeah. So um I just wanted to say that my mom found a clinket name for me. Um but I think actually it doesn't really stick with me that much. It's K A T dash G I dash S H A H. Um, I just don't, I don't really feel a connection to it, but I do feel a connection to the name Hooday that I talked about before. And uh -huh. so I think I, for now, I want to go by Hooday, but, um, Maybe changing it once my mom talks to the elders in Alaska. Cool. Thank you for sharing. Can you please spell it for me again? Yeah, it's K A T dash G I dash S H A H. Oh, Because my ex who's Native American, uh -huh. um, he has a girlfriend named Charlotte, and she goes by Kat, and I think that's her, also a Native name that she has, so uh -huh. I just don't really want to go by that, um, but I do, like, feel now 
feel a connection to the name Who Day. So I think I want to go by Who Day. And can you spell Who Day for me? Uh, that yeah. I have to look for because it's in my mom's messages somewhere. Okay, thanks. Go ahead, Shirley. Uh, you don't need the dash. Okay. Maybe Shirley knows how to spell Who Day too. Yeah, and uh, S H A H. I probably don't need the last H. I wonder if it's a double A. It, yeah, it could be if it's Shaw. Uh, yeah. Kutki Shaw. Otherwise, it's Shaw. Uh, and uh, that doesn't come across to me as a. Probably included the H in order to get that ah sound. Yeah. Uh, it's probably a double A. Yeah. Shaw. And then Kutki, it would be pronounced Kutki Shaw. Yeah. Which is pretty different from cat. If you did want to go by that name, just mentioning that it's pretty different from cat. That's pretty easy to pronounce too. Yeah, I think it's a beautiful name. Kutki Shaw. You think it's a beautiful name? Yeah. Ah, she could do. Yeah. Yeah. What does it mean? It's something woman? Yeah, something women. I think it's beautiful. I just don't really feel connection to it. Mm hmm. The G I might be a K I. Uh, uh, sounds like uh, it might be a K pinched. What did you say in your story again? You said that this name was given by what? How did you get Kutki Shah again? Uh, that's what my mom suggested, but I don't know how she found it. Oh, it, it wasn't a name that was already given to you? No, it's just something my mom found recently. Oh, okay. Well, it sounds very... Uh, Singet. Uh, yeah, it does. it's really a good... Uh, good sounding name. And it could be... Uh, she heard the name when she was younger, but it sounds like a, a real... And get name. What about who day? Do you know how to spell it, Shirley? Um, what does who day mean? Um, I think it means an owl that turns itself into the sun. Looks into the sun. I'm not familiar. Tsk. Uh, well, an owl is uh, tsk. Yeah, that's why I'm not sure what that, that I'm not sure if that's, I've not heard the word who day before. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Be fun to work on it. Yeah, it would take me some digging around to try to find something similar. Not sure. Good questions, though. Good discussion. How many people do we have? We currently have 14 people, including you and me. Okay. So I'm taking a six hour bus ride tomorrow to see my, my brother's basketball game in Portland. Okay. Shirley, were you saying something? Yeah, uh, we wanted to talk about the medicine today. Oh.
Yeah. Um, so getting that conversation started, uh, Shaksani, did you want to share about the name Shengit Nagu? Yeah. yeah, somebody asked me because they wanted to get a new name, a native name for the, for the uh, medicine program they have here at the hospital. And I said, it's, it's uh, what we would say would be Singet Nagu. Uh, and I, I said, I, I let her know that right away it probably wouldn't be accepted because of the word Singet. But I think when we say it, we're saying it's a native uh, because we refer to other people we see them even if we don't know what tribe they are they are native that means they're a thing get as far as you're concerned so think it nago means all it means is native medicine mm. so that of course they didn't use it <laughs> mm. because that seems like uh, uh, the university and, and also the hospital, uh, people are, are very, very cautious about things like that. When, when I was teaching, uh, I'm a Lingit, so what I know is, is to teach about the Lingit stuff, mm. but they didn't let me call it Lingit. They call, want me to call it native. Mm. So uh, the classes that I taught always had the title traditional native something. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I don't, I, I think with some explanation from the instructor, mm -hmm. um, that it's acceptable to to the people, uh, other natives that are, so they could always uh, uh, speak up what they know, you know. So I've been in groups where there were mixed uh, tribes. Yeah. And, they, and they're not afraid to, to share the same, in the same way that you're doing, you know, so. Yeah. I don't know. I'm seeing it, and here's what I know. You know mm -hmm. that they can talk about what they know, so it makes it you know, makes it such a wonderful uh, group discussion. Mm. Yeah, it makes it into an easy conversation too. It's like you share a little bit about what you know, and then someone else wants to chime in. Yeah, it, it kind of triggers something that nor and that's what i'm hoping today that we can do that with with all of you listening uh think it nago is um uh, in the books uh, our history books of that people put together about us they always refer to the shaman as uh medicine men and uh, uh, that's really not not true we had uh, people that did specifically medicine uh, for wounds and for diagnosis and other things uh, uh, and the shaman I think was more on the spiritual level I'm not sure uh, my parents were uh, religious, so they left that kind of information out of my training and uh, knowledge. So it's mostly what I've seen and heard in the books. People sometimes ask me about shaman. I have to admit, I don't know. Yeah. You don't know. But... Um, 
one of the uh, wonderful things that the <clears throat> that was done for medicine among our people mm. was um, they they did have people that were very very knowledgeable about the body and about uh, uh, treatment. So there were, for the women and children. Uh, they had women, um, you can call on women to help with uh, ch sick children or uh, take care of women. And uh, I don't think the medicine uh, women did uh, deliveries of babies. I think that was a separate uh, thing that was done by other women that had knowledge about uh, delivering babies. So uh, I don't think you needed a person that was knowledgeable about medicine to help deliver, because they, they do other things, a lot of other things, uh, examinations and, and uh, treatment uh, for, for the women. Then for the men, they had men that, uh, that took care of their needs uh, and also could include children. So uh, I know that uh, I, I witnessed uh, the knowledge that the women had about, uh, about the body. Uh, they seem to know exactly uh, how the soft organs feel in your body, the position, if they feel all right, if they're, uh, everything feels okay uh, in the examination, uh, they can they can tell. So, um, and uh, I think they, uh, no treatment with, uh, plants and medicate different kinds of medication. Uh, I know that uh, uh, kelp from the beach is, was used as iodine for cuts, but you have to be, make sure you, you put a lot of oil on the on the wound before you put the, put the iodine. The patient will shoot out of the chair the iodine was so strong oh yeah they used to i think they used to dry it and and then uh pound it into powder and uh, that was used as uh iodine for cups as far as i know but it's uh you have to use very very little mm. What does iodine do for cuts? The well, same thing that iodine does for you, for in your medicine cabinet. Uh -huh. to, for cuts, my mercurochrome and iodine. Uh -huh. Before you put the band aid on. Yeah. Okay. It just um, disinfects it. Yeah, it's a. I don't really know what it does, but yeah. I, I think as we yeah, talk. Yeah, it's, it's a disinfectant. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think that's what it does. Uh, yeah. So as we, we talk and go along on this, you're going to find out what I don't know. Yeah. So, In fact, but, you used to be able to buy iodine in little bottles that you paint on your cut before you put the Band-Aid on. Okay. Yeah. 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 I remember it being the color orange, and I remember getting yeah. it on my skin as a child, but I never knew what it did. And it's yeah. kind of powerful to to use just a few drops. Of, and uh, fortunately, I'm allergic to iodine. Oh. <laughs> use it. Oh, uh, dang. I'm also allergic to anything red, so I can't yeah. use mercurochrome either. So oh. I do what the old people do, wash. Wash the wound. Ouch. And then uh 
and then cover it. I'm always doing that. I blind, so I stick my hand in the in the drawer for the knife. And sometimes the knife finds me before I find it. Oh. So I'm always getting nicks and oh. on my fingers, but it's not bad. Just little scratches here and there, but. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the things that I learned um, when I was growing up, um, I learned like uh, some of the things, like I learned how to make cough syrup and out of like blueberry branches and like alder bark and and can't remember what else we used, devil's club. And I know, um, you know we always drank devil's club and hooligan oil, but, um, and then I, I know we always, put um, all their leaves inside of our shoes when we were hiking and yeah. it would revive our feet. Um, yeah. But the one thing I, I was trying to remember all the medicines that I learned from like Eva Davis and Ida Katashan and Amy Marvin and those guys who taught us. But one of the things I can't remember, there was like this white flower that grew in the marsh, you know, that's kind of like on the water, a white flower. And if you take that flower and put it in your pocket, you can, um, it's like a, create a, um, what do I want to call it? Um, uh, it's like that, uh, it, uh, it's like a, uh, attracts your, attracts a husband for you. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, hey. <laughs> I can't remember, but I remember that the that elder ladies would tell us about it. Yeah. Uh, at the mention of uh, uh, Uligan oil uh, or grease, uh, I was, uh, they, they had a ferry that went uh, from Huna to Juno. And there was always a lot of us that would go. And the, the ferry came late at night. So I went in uh, and I got a spot so I could lay down and just rest for the night. And uh, at the head of where I was laying was this uh, person from Huna talking to a young teacher. And he said, uh, talking to her, how do you like that? How do you like your job? How do you like the school? And he said, fine. I'm, I'm really new. Uh, he said, when I, I, and I have never uh, done any teaching before. And when I got here, he said, the principal uh, was really kind and, uh, and was sharing information and uh, after he finished uh, talking to me, he said, uh, these people are really, really nice, all of them, the children, everybody. But the thing about them is they always smell like oil. And uh, so he he said, uh, that's, that's one of the things that the, the principal shared with him. So he was talking about his uh, experience as he went along. He said, uh, during the middle of the winter, he said, I wasn't, I began to not feel too good and not a uh, not hundred percent. So uh, I was uh, taking a walk and uh, I ran into, uh, the old man, uh, George Dalton, and uh, uh, George greeted him and said, how are you doing, young man? He said, I'm, I'm doing fine. And so uh, <clears throat> they got to talking, and he revealed to uh, George Dalton that how he feels, and he's, he was wishing he could feel better. So George... Dalton said, come with me. So he took him uh, to his house. And out of the refrigerator, he pulled this small jar. And he said, here you are. He said, 
take this and take a spoonful every day and uh, but keep it in the refrigerator so um, he said okay so he started him taking it and he said and that really improved his uh, feelings and his health and uh, so the person who was talking to said it really worked he said yeah yeah I'm still doing it too and I was mm -hmm. thinking to myself yeah now you probably smell like the rest of us but <laughs> That was hooligan grease. Mm. It was used uh, a lot for like a daily uh, mm. vitamin thing rather than take uh, cod liver oil and take that. And, uh, and it's so delicious anyway <laughs> to yeah. me. Yeah. yeah. No. Mm. So that was uh, not like a wound, you know, or examination or anything. It's just talking about how he felt and what was needed. So apparently uh, what he got was uh, a good treatment uh, and it was uh, out of the mouth of a person that was not native. So it was really uh, good information for me. So, mm. yeah. so smart. And you would say um, ooligan oil? How would you say ooligan oil? Ooligan grease, yeah. 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 yeah, if you uh, keep it refrigerator, it it becomes uh, a little more solid, so you can yeah. scoop up easy with a spoon. Mm. Yeah, it's hard to get. Haynes is is the was the master uh, people for making and and uh, trading that and selling. So, mm. uh, and we used to have a small barrel of it outside the house. Uh, and my mom used to say, uh, go get a bowl of this grease, you know, and I'd scoop it up all nice and white and solid. It was beautiful. Wasa mm. idu mm. asap, I think it ain't a hooligan or grease oil. Corey, were you going to answer that? I can try. I believe it's sock AP, Kusha. Yeah. Ah. Sock AP. Yeah. Sock EFH. Grease from sock, the, the, uh, the fish that they get it from. Yeah. And okay. it really, really is a lot of work. Uh, it used to be, I think, that, uh, they would get uh, this very, very, uh, in fact, I think the white people call it candlefish. And I'm not sure, uh, uh, I, it might be the fish that we call ooligans here, I'm not sure. Mm. But very, very fat and they would take it and um, uh, have a special canoe for it. Uh, I'm talking about something I'm, I heard about and so, uh, I don't want to. I don't want to give misinformation, but uh, mm -hmm. because my mother was from Haynes, I kind of heard things about how it was done. That uh, I think sometimes they ferment it, and then they they put water uh, in the canoe, and then uh, put hot rocks in to uh, make the water hot. And that makes the fat rise to the top. And that's the part they scoop up. Yum. It's so clever to do it in a canoe. Yeah. Yeah. They had these, I think they had these special canoes that they used for that. Uh, a very, a very good container. Yeah. One of my friends, Dachtini Mary Cruz Valetti, goes to Haynes or Klukwan every year for harvesting sock or hooligan. And she taught, I haven't done it with her. She invites people to go, but she, 
she talked about digging pits too for the fermentation process. Is anyone familiar with that? Yeah, we actually had the pit out at culture camp. Oh. We've had one there forever. Like it's been there for generations and generations. And and we have a uh we have the pit and then we kind of build it in the embankment. And then what we do is we have a um cutoff um like oil drum that you can build the fire underneath and then you fill it with water and then you take the they used to have the the canoes all filled with the ooligan and then you would shovel them into the um well first of all you'd shovel them into the pit we have a pit that's in the ground a wood box pit uh -huh. into the ground okay. and then and then you would ferment it how many days you want to ferment it and some people like four day ferment some days people like six day ferment you know it depends on the uh -huh. weather and the you know like how cold it is and whatever yeah. And then once you got to the ferment to the point that you wanted, then you go to this oil drum, cut off oil drum thing that's kind of by it and you build the fire and put the, filled it with water and you then shovel the ooligan into the into the into that. So then you can then you um seep out the oil and you you know ladle the oil off the top and fill your jars with it. And mm -hmm. that's how you that's how, kind of how you do it. Mm, yeah I used, to, I used to feed my my kids hooligan grease every day uh, yeah. when they were growing up and they don't get sick even today they just don't really get sick they their immune systems are pretty good yeah and it tastes so much better than cod liver oil <laughs> is so, there any kind of a clean get cookbook because that would be amazing there is a couple of Clinket cookbooks. I know Huna did one, Angoon did one. The A and B, I mean A and S sisters used to have. They have a really old, old version of one. But I don't know if any really. I mean, I don't know about any newer versions of them. I just know that. Well, I think Search did one, too, a smaller version of like um, native foods and their. Um, and their um, nutritional value and how to prepare them. The, That's uh, really cool. The the work that was done uh, in studying the nutrient nutrient va uh, value of uh, native foods was very uh, simple uh, because of the funding it takes to find all of the nutrients that are available in, in the foods. So they tried to uh, uh, try to study uh, native foods from all over Alaska. Mm. So the Clinket food was uh, was part of it, but uh, because we're we're really different too, so makes it kind of yeah. interesting to to look into that yeah. yeah so uh uh before we use up our time i wanted to also talk about my mother yeah. uh, my mother uh, her marriage was arranged when she was just still a teenager and uh, i think after um she was married for a while. Uh, her face, half of her face, uh, became paralyzed, and uh, her eye was drooping, and her lips were uh, sagging, and uh, her, her that part of her face was just dead. And she was really, really uh, didn't want people to see it. So she always tried to cover it with a scarf. And uh, my, uh, my dad, uh, in, in uh, the people that he, he knows, he uh, found a friend that he hadn't seen for a long time and invited him for uh, dinner. So 
here's my mom trying to cover her face. And um, uh, at the same time, take care of the guests. And so they visited and had uh, dinner. And after the dinner was over and the man was getting ready to leave, he called my mother over and he took her hands and he said uh, he noticed, you know, that she was having that trouble with her, her face. And it didn't seem to affect her hands, but uh, she um, kept using the scarf and he said, um the he he knew that there was two reasons two reasons why a, a a face would get paralyzed. He said, I have medication that can take care of one of them. He said it only works for one kind. So he said, I'll I'll go to the boat and I'll get the medicine and have you try it and see if it works. So he brought it to her and gave her instructions as to uh, what to do. And uh, she was so excited. And so she got on it immediately and followed his instructions uh, and, and completely treated her that side of her face, and miraculously, it worked. She, uh, uh, it, the per, uh, paralysis was gone. Wow. And uh, she, what happened was, she forgot uh, to treat her forehead. Uh, it's only she treated only from her eyebrows down. And uh, so for the rest of her life, she had that uh, part of her forehead that was, uh, it never had the feeling in it. Hmm. So, but I don't know what kind of medicine it was or if the, if the medical field today <clears throat> knows if there's two reasons, uh, probably a stroke and something else that would cause the paralysis uh, like that. Uh, she never said that I got real sick and then I woke up and my face was, never said anything like that. It's just that uh, she had it and uh, she really, really worried about how she appeared to the public. So. Uh, yeah, that that, that was uh, always in my head to wonder about that kind of thing. She would have been the envy of all of the women these days getting Botox, so their forehead doesn't wrinkle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've heard of that too. Yeah, she was so pretty anyway. She, and then I could see how important that would be. Uh, and and she didn't have trouble talking, and she her 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 face was just real normal looking. So, um, yeah, something I heard, and I have no idea how or why it worked. thank you for sharing. Uh, yeah, there was a. Uh, uh, as as we go along, you're you're gonna realize that I I know nothing. <laughs> so, uh, I, the stories that I I have that are real. Uh, uh, when I was a a kid, if uh, a saying about uh, frogs causing warts, yeah, that was, that was really true. My brother and I we used to play with frogs. Yeah. And so in the palms of both of my hands, oh. all these warts. I mean, it was just oh. a lot of them. Yeah. Uh, and I was uh, around my older sister. I had an older sister that was almost as old 
as my mother because uh, from my dad's first marriage, she said, what are you doing? Because I was picking on them. And she said, what are you doing? Let me look at it. So she was looking at my hands and and uh, inspected it. The tops of my hands were not involved at all. And she said, I want you to, to go home and cover both of your hands with seal grease and then go find some newborn puppies and have them lick it off. What? So, uh, boy, I, I knew exactly where to go because I <laughs> had been just playing with some puppies that were that I discovered under the house. Oh. I, I put the grease on there and I, I crawled into the dark and uh, and the, fortunately the mother was real friendly. So the puppies came running over and they uh, started licking my hands and I let them lick uh, all the oil from the top of my hands, the palm of my hands, everywhere. And then uh, I could hardly wait uh, to get back out in, in the light so I could look at my hand. And I finally crawled out of that dark space and uh, looked at my hands. All the words were still there. Oh. Then, and I thought, oh, well, you know. So um, I, I spent the day, and then the next morning when I woke up, my hands were both completely clear, completely no indication that I ever had warts on my hands. Wow. Yeah. So I don't know how it works. People ask me, was it the oil or was it the puppies? <laughs> I, no. Uh, it, if it's one or the other, she didn't say. She didn't say. Just, just put the oil on it; it'll go away. You know. She said, "No, you had to find these puppies to uh, lick it off." Huh. I had warts too, but I had to get them frozen off. Yeah, I think the puppies is a better option. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's easier. I had warts uh, recently, and on my fingers and I went to the doctor and they tried to freeze it and it just wouldn't go away. So th this doctor said, I know how to handle it. People don't realize that you, uh, first you need need to uh, clear the tops of, a, of the warts. And, and then uh, he said, you have to do it four times. Uh, and uh, before it works. So I went to him uh, and he would take a, a knife and and cut into the warts on my fingers. Okay. And uh, so we were talking and, and he was uh, working on it and he said, does it hurt? Uh, <laughs> of course it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, but anyway, after four times, uh, you carve it and then you freeze it or or burn it. And each time, I my fingers were bandaged up. After four times, I was so anxious, and I looked, the warts were still there. No. Oh. Yeah. Didn't have any seal grease or puppies, hey? Puppies, yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> It, oh, remind, it yeah. reminded me of, um, I, they, I was also taught that um, when you get, the, the, like when people have a bad burn, like they get burned from a fire or a bad burn, um, we would put um, cold seal fat and lay it on it and wrap it on it. And then that way it would heal without a scar. Yeah. Oh, I've heard of that too. Oh. Yeah, if, uh, in the future, if you have, uh, a problem, put the seal grease on there and go to the shelter. <laughs> <Where is it? laughs> Get yourself a puppy. <laughs> Have any new puppies? <laughs>
Mm-hmm. It's for my war treatment. What I found out was that all the other doctors that tried to burn my warts off weren't doing it right. And <gasps> so I finally got this good doctor and she did it like one time and they were off in like a week. Oh. Yeah. But they're pretty hard to, to get get rid of. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I kept thinking uh, if I had uh, new puppies or maybe even a cat, I don't know. <laughs> we would try it in a pinch. <laughs> <I'd try it. laughs> in a pinch. Use a cat in a pinch. <laughs> <laughs> Such a be, something you come in with this hands full of grease to the shelter and say, Do you have any new puppies? A treat for them. You have a treat for them. <laughs> it's a win win. <laughs> oh, funny. Yeah, I think it's. Uh, the other story is something you guys already know and agree about is uh, we were uh, walking on the beach and uh, my mom and my brother and his wife and their kids. And uh, apparently uh, we weren't trying to be quiet or anything. It was a really a nice day too, it's nice and sunny and kids were chasing each other. And then um, the oldest oldest boy uh, fell, and he put his hands down to to catch himself, and he gashed his his whole palm. Ooh. And uh, so my mom took a look at it, and she told my my brother, uh, "Have it go to that stream and wash it." And she took a knife and went into the woods. And uh, so after he was all cleaned up, uh, she came out and it was, I, I'm pretty sure it was from uh, Devil's Club mm-hmm. medicine. And she had a handful of it. So he, she just put it on there and they wrapped it with a handkerchief or something we had. And uh, so when we got back into town, it was too late to get a plane. So the next day, uh, the the weather was too bad, and he couldn't he couldn't get a plane to go. So finally, on the third day, the plane came, and he went in to see the doctor, thinking, "Okay, going to be a lot of stitches," mm-hmm. and uh, so. He still had the Devil's Club medicine on there. And um, so the doctor said, okay, what is it? You know, and she said, uh, the nurse said, well, it's a big gash, but uh, he's got some kind of medicine on there. So he said, okay, let me take a look. So he uh, looked at it, moved the medicine he looked at it put it back he said wrap his hand up and send him home yeah so they left he gave him instructions about how long to keep it on there and he never had to have stitches on his hand wow traditional medicine will work every time yeah you know how to how to work it um, my aunt was walking through the bush and she thunk got her axe stuck in her shin mm. and she went to a tree and she pulled some of the pine sap off and chewed it and then she spread it over the wound and she's had never had a cleaner healing wound ever yeah oh the medicine's there yeah, yeah. i know it it was um uh, a big uh, study for the uh, Clinkets. They really uh, kept up with uh, the the plant study. The, the, the uh, medicine men and women 
uh, were very knowledgeable about plants and how to mm -hmm. use them. And uh, also uh, apparently studied the anatomy of, of people. So um, uh, one time I, I, I saw all these women standing looking really worried outside the house a house and uh pretty soon pretty soon um the medicine woman came out of the house and they were real anxious to hear because uh, they knew that the the uh the chief's wife was had been very ill mm. and she said uh I examined her and her body is just full of lumps. Oh no. And uh so she's not gonna, you know, not gonna make it. And that was true. So um and that was without a doctor, so mm -hmm. or a nurse. She was the doctor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're um at time, Shock Sunny Cake, but thank you so much for sharing and hosting such a good discussion. Thank you, everybody, for contributing. Yeah, I hope that it will uh, impress you enough to try to do some research on your own on some of the, these uh, things that we used to know and do. Uh, I think the medicine women and the medicine men kind of gave up because of the introduction of new sickness such as mumps and measles and tb and uh they didn't know how to treat that kind of stuff yeah i imagine after some study they could have been able to but uh, they also were infected by some of these problems yeah, yeah. yeah my yeah. My great grandmother Carrie Sint Carrie Jackson was the last medicine person in uh, Teslin, Dehlin, and um, she delivered over two hundred babies. Wow! Yeah. Whoa! That's, that's, ah. my, that's what my mom did too. She delivered. Uh, she she knew so much uh, that uh, my dad finally said. Uh, Okay, uh, that's too much work because a lot of times you have to go in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, I want you to just start taking it easy. So then the it was I, I was visiting and the phone rang and I said, in a panic, we need to find out about um, what to do with the baby's cord. And um, she, she said, just use some string. If you don't have string, uh, use uh, shoestrings, but make sure you boil it before you use it. So, so, so the phone rings again and all in a panic. Gotta have the help. Gotta, you know, all excited. And over and over, the phone kept ringing. And, and it said, finally, my mom said, okay, I guess I'll have to go up there. So <laughs> I went with her and uh, they told her uh, the girl was in, in the bedroom. She was really uh, having a lot of pains. My mom went in there and uh, after she was in there for a while, she came out and said, she's not going to have a baby right now. Oh. She's just tired. Uh -huh. and, uh, so, and they, and they, uh, told my mom, I said, that's not true. She's been in pain for all this time and the baby will be delivered. And I said, no, not tonight. There's going to be no baby. So 10 days later, she had finally had her baby. But <laughs> So just uh, without examination, just by talking to her and looking at her, she was able to diagnose that uh, she wasn't ready to deliver, just tired. Well, thank goodness for your mother. <laughs> so. Yeah, could the geishin get? Yeah, no. There's always two women. 
two women to deliver. Oh. I used to have to go with my mom <clears throat> because she didn't like to be out there at, at night by herself. <clears throat> so I had a little pillow and a blanket and I would just make my bed and go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Good discussion. We're a uh, we're a little over on time, but this is so good to hear y'all your guys's input. Um, you're slow to warm up as a class. When we start talking, we any questions or comments, it's like really quiet, and then right at the end, everyone has something to say. So I just want to encourage you to chime right in in the beginning. Don't be shy. Uh, Shirley and I are here to support you and help you and uh cultivate your learning journeys so don't be shy and we'll let you know we'll let you know what you don't know yeah so. see you guys on tuesday okay, okay. see you yanaka okay this is my grandpa okay that's a nice classroom yeah have fun in hawaii i will thank you I'll be gone next week, but surely we'll uh, be here to take care of you guys. Yeah.